Welcome to the Emergence Playbook. I'm Gordon Ritter, and I'm honored today to have Roy Renani to uh, join me here at our one of our inaugural Emergence Playbook events. Roy, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. All right. It's great to be here. So um, the goal today is to learn more about you and learn about Chorus. And uh, so why don't we start, uh, tell us a little bit about Chorus.ai and why you started the company. So our vision with Chorus is to turn conversations into an organization's most valuable asset. And so today, if you think about it, all the revenue that uh, an organization supports, all the business that they close, happens through conversations between sales reps and customers. But today, we don't know anything about what's happening in those conversations. Conversation happens, you take some notes, you enter them into Salesforce or your CRM, and that's what you're left with. But if you have a 50-person sales team, there are over 10,000 hours that you're spending in meetings. And no human can possibly go through all that. And so you get these little snippets when somebody happens to sit in on a meeting or shadow a call. And so our AI automatically records, transcribes, and learns from all those meetings so that you can understand what's working, what's not working. You can learn from your best salespeople. You can learn about your customers um, and do that all at scale. And so that's essentially the vision. How do we do that? And over time, bring context-specific information to salespeople in the moment so that they can have a better conversation, they can create better buyer experiences, and of course, they can close more business. So it sounds like you're basically unlocking this massive black box of data that nobody really had access to before. That's exactly it. And so with AI and machine learning, which is a big theme these days, um, you start with, you have to start with data. And what's interesting about the problem that we're solving is that conversations as a data set is something that nobody's ever thought of as a data set. So most organizations today aren't even capturing it. And so you have to start somewhere. And uh, the beauty about the algorithms and the learning is that even if, you're not, even if you're not persuaded or convinced about everything the technology can do today, if your competitor has been capturing this data for a year and the algorithms are a year further advanced from now, the types of patterns uh, and insights that it'll be able to discover over that past year of data is just massive. And so we're seeing really forward-thinking companies already starting to capture this data and act on it, and that advantage will just grow over time as the data set grows and as the algorithms advance. And why do you think now is the time for this to happen? The concept of gathering information from calls has, has been around. Why now? It's a great question. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think, uh, the technology is just at a point where it works. So speech recognition, even five years ago, wouldn't work for you. Most people now, if they have an Alexa at home, they know that the speech recognition algorithms work really well, um, and they don't need to be perfect to get you to those moments that matter and to get you to those moments that you can learn from. So I think, first and foremost, the technology is there. Um, second of all, organizations have seen a big shift towards inside sales. So more and more software companies especially are moving towards these mid-market SMB sales where you can close a 50, 100,000, some of our customers even, even close $200,000 deals completely remotely. When you have that type of a sale where it's so much easier to capture the data on a platform like Zoom or GoToMeeting or WebEx, uh, and you combine it with the fact that in inside sales, you often have high turnover, you often have these high growth companies that are adding lots and lots of salespeople. And so the one of the strongest levers that you can have in terms of your, your company's growth is how quickly you can ramp up these salespeople, how quickly you can get them having uh, good conversations. And so it's probably a combination of the technology and the fact that so much more business is being done over online meetings that just make it um, yeah, something worth focusing on. Yeah. So before we get uh, more into the details, you know, tell us a little bit about why you started Chorus. What was your background prior? And what got you to focus on this amazing opportunity? I'm a, I'm a nerd by training. Uh, so I studied engineering science at the University of Toronto, and I always loved uh, the really hard engineering problems, the cross-disciplinary ones, and uh, never had a chance to, to work on them. So I went into business consulting uh, and some venture capital. And I knew that I wanted to go back to something really technical and work on a problem that nobody had started working on yet. And so three years ago, um, machine learning was becoming all the rage, uh, at least in some pockets of, of the internet and some communities. And, uh, and I started getting really into it. And um, the only next step that I took was, well, 
I wonder if you could apply this type of technology to conversations. And uh, languages and music and voice are just, is just something that I'm personally very passionate about. And so uh, me and uh, two friends, uh, Micha Breakstone and Russell Levy, got together and said, I wonder if we could take these neural networks uh, and these machine learning algorithms and start to deconstruct a conversation. And um, that was really the first step. Uh, and when we looked at the data sets that we would need to build these learning algorithms, these self-learning algorithms, um, and create something that would be valuable for businesses, sales was the natural place to focus. And so 15 years ago, my first job was, was actually doing phone-based sales for a tech company. Um, and so, you know, that was pretty much the start of it. And when you started, uh, when you would have conversations with these sales leaders, you found out that they actually had no visibility at all into the conversations that their teams were having. Uh, and that was the big aha moment for us. Like, wow, there's just no way that five years from now, um, we're going to be completely blind to all of these insights, all of this data, um, and all this learning that's happening in these conversations. So you said that uh, AI is all the rage, and it clearly is. Um, how do you help us sort of understand, how do you differentiate a company that talks about AI versus one that's really going after it? How, how are you differentiating Chorus from all the others? There, there is a lot of marketing out there today. Um, so what makes, what makes a real AI company? Um, I think the first thing is actually having access to data. And so one of the, you know, there are some companies that purport to be AI companies, but if you actually look at how much data they have, um, it's actually very difficult to believe that they're creating these self-learning um, types of engines. And so one of the things that we're really proud of is that we have over 900,000 conversations that have gone through Chorus's platform. And so if you, if you start with a big data set, you're going to have a foundation for learning. Um, the second thing is making sure that you have the right expertise to be able to go in and extract the useful information from all that data. And so one of the things that we invested in from the very beginning was building our entire technology stack in-house. And that means that when we go into a conversation, whether it's the speech recognition and making sure that we have the highest accuracy that's tuned for sales conversations so that we can get access to that high quality transcript, uh, we have that. If it means being able to go in and uh, have technology that can separate the different speakers in a conversation to know when a prospect is saying something or when it's our customer or the company that's saying something um, and having that be as accurate as possible. Um, and then thinking about the problem that you're solving and saying, okay, do they have the right technology to actually close the loop and solve that problem? Um, in our case, we wanna solve the problem of not just identifying the patterns, but actually changing behaviors. So actually, you know, having the insights come out of big data in the cloud or in a dashboard somewhere isn't nearly as impactful for our customers as being able to change a conversation as it's happening. And so the other reason that we built everything in-house was to be able to deliver that real-time feedback to a salesperson in a meeting to help them have a better conversation. One thing you and I have talked about many times is that we're, we're afraid of anything that is seen as a script, where we're just putting reps through some kind of script process and, and, uh, and you have been committed to not doing that all along. In fact, the whole technology is based around that. You say you want to make reps better at their jobs. Tell us a little bit about how you're, how you're actually doing that. You know, it's interesting. One of our, uh, one of our true norths um, at the company is helping reps be more confident. Um, because at the end of the day, so much of how effectively you sell comes down to confidence. Um, and so there are two things um, in sales that I think matters. The first thing is um, nailing the fundamentals, right? So this actually has nothing to do with the conversation itself, um, but sometimes you just get in the moment and you lose track of things. And so it might be something as simple as, you know, hey, Gordon, we're halfway through this meeting. Are you getting what you wanted to get out of this interview? And it's a simple tactic, but... An AI, as simple as it is, can tell you you're halfway through the meeting and you actually haven't covered half the topics you want to be covering. Or similarly, hey, you know, we only have five minutes to go. Let's start thinking about what the next step is. Um, so it starts with things like that. And then it gets more interesting as you start to understand the specific conversations that a company wants to have. Um, the most common thing is translating an initiative from leadership down to the front lines. And so if you have a competitor that you're always coming up against in the market, you're spending a lot of energy coming up with positioning statements 
and messaging or battle cards. Um, the hardest thing is actually getting a rep in the moment to use that battle card. And so one of the things that Chorus can do is when that competitor comes up in conversation, bring the rep that battle card in real time so that they have access to that information if they want it. Um, and the analogy that we use internally is, you know, we want it to be the equivalent of an experienced manager just putting a post-it note in front of the rep so that they can choose to use it if they want to. And so it might start with how you manage the meeting. It'll move towards bringing them information that is already available to them, but just get it to them right when they need it. And beyond that, it'll be the equivalent of a manager that's been able to learn not just from the thousand calls that they happen to have uh, been involved with uh, during their tenure at the company, but a manager that's been able to learn from every meeting that the company's ever had and tell a rep, you know, I'm picking up on a pattern here. You might want to ask this question. Really interesting. It's, it's that it's a, a dynamic, almost a cheat sheet that, that certainly reps take advantage of, but this is something that's moving very, very quickly. Words change, ideas change, and chorus can move with that dynamic change and not even require the manager to do it. It will happen automatically as, uh, as quality shows up. That's right. And one of the things that we've invested a lot in is learning, mm -hmm. right? And so with a lot of AI, you do want to start with some form of supervised learning. And so one of the things that we've, we've learned, uh, which is really interesting, is we can learn from the types of comments and coaching that managers provide through the platform. And we're actually going to release a blog post about this uh, in a little bit. It might even be live by the time <laughs> you're watching this. Um, but it's really interesting to see, for example, that a lot of managers, the most common thing that they coach reps on are the questions that they asked or didn't ask. Right? And so we can learn from the moments in conversations that managers are saying, hey, you should have asked about this or you should have asked about that. And that's, those are those seeds of learning that go into the algorithms that allow us to identify those moments where we might want to position something. And so ironically, the, the more powerful the technology becomes, the more important those key people are in your organization. Right? If you don't have some phenomenal sales reps that are doing really creative, innovative things in the moment, you're not going to be able to learn from that and share it with the rest of the organization. If you don't have managers that are investing the time to develop their people and pick up on these things that matters, there, there won't be those seeds of learning for the algorithms. But once you do have those seeds, the power is, is in how you can roll it out at scale to the rest of the organization and have them benefit from it. That's great. Well, so let's shift gears a little bit to your kind of operating strategy. Um, you've got your go-to-market strategy is in the U.S., and then your entire dev team is in Israel. How have you found kind of those two huge and important areas of the firm in completely different locations? How have you dealt with that and managed that and made it prosper? Yeah, well, I think if we're being honest, saying that anything in a startup is prospering is hard because you're, you know, you're working on so many things at once. Um, but the way that I describe it is that um, now that we're building out the go-to-market side of the team, uh, it's like having a twin that you never met uh, your entire life. Um, and so in the first half of our life, I was spending most of my time in Israel, right? So helping hire those, you know, amazing, courageous people that are leaving, um, you know, that are leaving stable jobs, uh, convincing their spouses in many cases to come, you know, come on this journey with us. Um, and helping build out that team. Uh, and then it was setting up the US side of things um, on the go-to-market side. The, the challenges for us have been mostly around the time zones and mostly around how you can share insights back with the team in Israel. Um, and how do you, what are some specific things you've done that have helped, helped with that? Yeah, so I mean, the, the first thing is you definitely have to overinvest in going back and forth. And I think as hard as it is to make time, uh, you just need to do it. And, and I would say we don't do it enough, but every time you do do it, you're reminded of that. So make the time to go in person, make the time to bring you know, any key person to spend a week in the other office and get to know people. Um, the second thing that we've done is we use Zoom a lot. And we use Zoom as Teams, we use Zooms, like Slack is very powerful, but sometimes you just need those face-to-face -face meetings. Um, the third thing is making time for them. Um, and this is the difficult part. I mean, you have to make sacrifices around when you're willing to meet with people. And one of the things that we've tried to do as a culture is say, you know, hey, everybody, I know it might be difficult, but you might have to take a meeting at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. 
um, just to keep things moving quickly because speed is everything uh, at a company at our stage. And so really setting that as a part of the culture and saying, you know, let's reserve some time every week or every day where we don't book meetings in our local office during this time because it's, it's one of those precious moments where there's overlap with Israel. Um, and we try to do that. Um, and then like anything, we look at it quarterly and we say, what could we do better? That's great. Well, look, we're, we're running out of time. Maybe one more question. Um, you know, what you've, you've been on this journey with Chorus for uh, a couple of years now. It's been amazing, probably a little longer, but you've made so much progress in such a short amount of time. What have been the, what's the one mistake if you look back and say, I wish I had known this, uh, you know, know what I know now back then. What's the mistake you made and, and uh, how would you have not made it at this point? Well, if I, if I could boil it down into one word, um, as a founder or a co-founder, um, it would be lead time. So everything has a lead time. And if you're a first time founder or a first time founding team, I think you would be shocked at how long some things take. Um, and so, you know, if I could, if I could write, and I don't know, maybe you can help me write this, uh, or the emergency team can help me write this. If you could write a blog post that just said, you know, these are each of the key, uh, people you need to hire for example, at a company at your stage, as you go through you know, the normal process, and here's how long it'll take you to hire that person. Or uh, if you're hiring, you know, if you're starting a sales team, here's how long it'll take them to get up to speed and ramped up. Uh, and you just worked backwards from your goals for the year, you'd probably realize that you need to start four to six months earlier than you would naturally think, just because of how long some of these things take. And so if there's one thing that I kick myself about, it's not starting soon enough, on some of these things. And then, you know, to close that gap, um, if you have the funding for it, going out and maybe getting some consultants to help you in the meantime or something like that. But um, yeah, lead time, don't underestimate it. Excellent, well, Roy, thank you so much for being here today. We really, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, so just signing off from uh, Emergence Playbook, uh, this is Gordon Ritter and Roy Renani. And I uh, just want to say take a look at Chorus.ai and uh, let us know if we can help make an introduction to Roy. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>